This video contains endgame spoilers for Soul Hackers 2. If you haven't played it yet, and you don't want to see that kind of thing, here's your chance to click off. As for the rest of you, well, let's get to it. Soul Hackers is one of my favorite games that Atlas has ever released. It takes the whole technology meets demons idea from mainline Shin Megami Tensei and explores how that could look in a more corporate, dystopian future, where technological development has reached its zenith, trading bombed out demon infested cities and trips through the underworld for grungy corporate offices and unnerving virtual spaces. Rather than playing as a character who's simply trying to survive in a horrible, violent world, you're a misfit cyber criminal who's thriving in one of the world's most advanced cities. At least, of course, until conspiracy begins to emerge that could threaten the well-being of the entire population. The game's combat and exploration are definitely old school, but easy to pick up. Your demons can choose not to listen to you if you don't booze them up first. The soundtrack is amazing. The environments are moody and atmospheric. The game has significant connections to the original Devil Summoner without feeling forced. The characters have largely great designs and are very memorable. I don't really know how much further I can put this game's nuts into my mouth, and my point here is that if I like this game so much, you'd think I'd have been shitting my pants when I saw the announcement for Soul Hackers 2. I mean come on, the first game was originally released in 1997. We're kinda living in that interconnected corporate future the game envisioned. The potential for a sequel seemed endless. My best hope when the game first started being teased on Twitter was some kind of updated port of the first game to the Switch, but when the bomb dropped and it was Soul Hackers 2, I don't know, something about it just didn't feel right. The combat looked, and you're gonna hate me for saying this, like a Persona game. This owl mascot thing seemed out of place, and where's the Devil Summoner in the title? It felt more like a reboot than a sequel, especially without the excellent art of Kazuma Kaneko and I was definitely holding my breath about how this one would turn out. It's been a couple months since then, and I've had a lot of time to play through and think about the game. So, were my judgments about the trailer wrong? Does this game offer any fun innovations? Is the story any good? Let's dive in and see what it brings to the table. The finest aspects of Soul Hackers 2 are its story and characters. The plot revolves around the exploits of two not-quite-human beings, Ringo and Fig, who are snapped into existence at the start of the game by this super-intelligent entity known as Ion that watches over the entire world. Foreseeing some kind of impending doom that will end life as we know it, the two are sent out to track down a couple of individuals key to stopping the destruction. Aero, a devil summoner for the peacekeeping Yadagarasu organization, and Melody, who's, well, the exact opposite a summoner for the Phantom Society that wants to wipe the Earth clean. Unfortunately, they've both already been killed while out on missions for their respective employers, but luckily, Ringo is able to use Ion's power to soul hack them and give them a second chance to get revenge on their killers and save the planet. Turns out, there's this big power struggle going on right now for Covenants, these magical power sources that can only be taken from their carriers by death. With the help of another deceased Covenant holder, Saizo, the gang goes around the city as they learn why exactly the Phantom Society wants to destroy the world and what it means to be a human. It's a decent setup. Arrow, Saizo, and Melody can basically be seen as stand-ins for Law, Neutral, and Chaos respectively, and I was a bit worried that the game would lean too hard into that. Fortunately, this is not the case. These are pretty dynamic characters that have fleshed out backstories and some interesting internal conflicts. Arrow has a troubled past with a friend he grew up with at his orphanage, which itself was controlled by the Yadagarasu to groom new summoners. Melody was literally in bed with one of the Phantom Society's leaders, Iron Mask, who turns out to be a completely different Iron Mask than the one you're going after for most of the game. Saizo has relationship struggles, and his story highlights how becoming a summoner really changes your life forever. There are times where Melody, as a member of the Phantom Society, kind of seems to act cold or withholds information, when it would be so much easier to just talk to the party, and Arrow can come off as a bit plain sometimes, but overall, these three are excellent characters to focus the story around, and the voice actors do a solid job. In my eyes, that's a fate worse than death. <sighs> Sheesh, you're stubborn. I've never met anyone so unnecessarily complex or annoying or just plain stupid. <laughs> you hear that? 
That goes for you, too. Might have escaped while we were dealing with Kabaragi. Gotta say, though, this looks less like a fugitive's den and more like a lab. A lot of files here, but it's pretty dry, academic stuff. Historical records, demon analysis... Whoa, you uh, might want to see this. Though I will admit, for about the first 15 hours of this game, I thought Era was voiced by Yuri Lowenthal. He's actually voiced by Zach Aguilar, and once I learned that, I couldn't help but see his performance as an impression of Yuri Lowenthal. No shade to him though, the voice suits the character quite well. In a move that is somewhat rare for the franchise, Ringo is actually a fully fledged character herself, and honestly, she's great. Ringo might actually be one of my favorite protagonists. Going in, I was kind of thinking her whole development arc would be like, oh, I'm living in this human world and I'm actually a robot with no feelings, but thankfully, while it does touch on feeling out of place among humans, Ringo is a very expressive and likable character. Her English voice work is great, her design is cool, and the way she deals with demons and the game's villains is confident and enjoyable to watch. I was always looking forward to her reaction towards whatever was going on, especially when choosing dialogue options during cutscenes. My least favorite main character was actually Fig, who kinda ends up being the game's true villain. The owl drone Mimi is her thing that she controls, and despite the fact that she never stops talking while you're in dungeons, Fig overall felt like she barely had any presence at all in the story. This may have been intentional seeing as how shocked Ringo is when she goes all crazy, like oh shit, we never really paid attention to this girl, but I don't know, she just felt bland when compared to the others. In terms of the other villains, Ash, Saizo's crazy ass ex-girlfriend, and Kaburaki, Eru's old friend from the orphanage, end up being temporary adversaries as you make your way through the city, and they're pretty good, but my favorite by far was Iron Mask. Forget about his true identity for a second, I think he just looks cool. The striped mask, that shotgun, his suit, and his calm command over his demon Zenin. I mean, come on. That shit's intimidating, and his voice work is great too. He's gonna tear us apart if we don't stay cool. Or he might just tear you apart in spite of it. I take it you're Iron Mask. Is that right? That I am. You want to take that mask off? Hard to negotiate with someone when you can't look them in the eyes. The only face I have is the one you see. I can hardly just take it off. In terms of just raw visuals and what he sounds like, I loved him. His writing, well, maybe not as good. He spends a lot of time dishing out these corny lines to the main party. Like, when they ask him why he wants to destroy the world, he basically just face palms and says nobody would understand. You eventually find out through a somewhat obvious plot twist that Mildy's past with Iron Mask was with some other dude who used to wear the mask, and now it's Raven, a Yadigarasu guy who works at the orphanage Arrow came from. He wants to use the Covenant's power to cleanse the planet and ensure a future for the kids. It's a really cheesy and ill-conceived plan, but I'm gonna let it slide because I enjoyed every scene this man was in. I wish the writers dove more into how he managed to do all that villain shit and be at home at dinner time at the orphanage almost every day. That's probably the most impressive part of his entire character. There's a substantial amount of optional content that lets you see more of each of these characters that you can access by progressing through each of the main party's respective soul matrices, which are god-awful dungeons that you'll unfortunately have to tolerate if you want to squeeze out every drop of the story. We'll talk about that in a bit. The payoff can be kind of cool since the big lore drops there are fully voiced. You can also access a whole horde of smaller, unvoiced moments through the game's hangout mechanic. These were enjoyable. Obviously some of them are more interesting than others. You don't really get to choose what you talk about or anything, the characters just talk. But they largely do a good job of making everyone feel more like people that exist outside of the interactions you as a player have with them. I will say, while the story is this game's strong suit, I do have a few general criticisms about it. First off, to me, the opening hours felt a bit dull and poorly paced. Each of the three party members' soul hack scenes basically come right after the other and feel long and drawn out. We don't even know who these characters are yet when we bring them back to life, so it's kinda hard to feel any sort of way about how they ended up dead in the first place. In the first soul hackers, 
you went on vision quests that literally had you play as a deceased person, giving you a real glimpse at how they interacted with others and the fatal mistakes that led to their downfall. Here, it felt a little clunky, like you find a corpse and beg them to come back to life because we gotta save the world. I don't know, it felt a little less imaginative, but like I said, it's good enough to get the game started. Actually, speaking of soul hacking, there's nothing out there that can convince me the writers did not have a contest to use that phrase as much as possible. These characters say soul hack so much to the point that it borders on parody. I don't think they flat out say it at all in the first game. Name dropping the title of your game can be cool, but when it happens like 50 or 60 times, you can't help but laugh a little. Soul Hackers 2 also feels the need to over explain everything happening on the screen at times, especially in its initial chapters, with long exposition scenes that go into what covenants are, what soul hacking is, what Ringo's mission is, restatements of what people have been talking about for the past 10 minutes. Important stuff, sure, but I recall a point early on in the game where I went like 40 minutes hardly touching the controller at all. I think Atlas could have trusted their audience a bit more to understand the relatively simple plot. I also found it a bit difficult to get down with some of the themes of this game due to the actions of Atlas itself. Being a cyberpunk game, the story explores greed in a stagnant, vapid society generated by unchecked capitalism. How do you expect me to take a story like that seriously when you're selling day one DLC and a digital premium edition that costs $90? The mascot of this game, Iho, was a pre-order bonus. You can't use this game's mascot demon without playing in a corporate marketing shit? Come on now. They even have the audacity to drop this line about how people are having their nostalgia repackaged and sold back to them. Oh really? You mean like this $13 DLC that has fan favorite demons in it? Now, I know the writers probably didn't make the call to have what by all means should have been base game content stripped from the game and sold to people separately, but it really is unfortunate that it turned out that way. Anytime this game tried to talk about society or something, I just could not get those DLC prices out of my head. Finally, I felt like the last act was a bit rushed and underwhelming. You can tell throughout the game that Fig has some problems with how humans suffer, but bam, all of a sudden she's ready to destroy the world too, having learned nothing from the whole Iron Mask charade. The forms she takes as the final boss of this game are also definitely on the lower end of the franchise in terms of intimidation factor and sheer coolness too. The first half of the fight is basically just her, but angrier. Despite these critiques, the story and especially the characters are pretty well done. It's definitely going to be the part you remember most from this game. Now, let's jump into the gameplay. This is where it gets a bit uglier. I'm just going to come right out and say this. Soul Hackers 2's combat is a direct downgrade from pretty much any Mega 10 game I can think of from the past 15 years. Let me lay it out for you. In this game, you have four people in your party. Each has the ability to equip a demon that you select. It basically looks like Persona 5, but with less options. The main gimmick is that hitting enemies with attack types that they're weak to adds stacks to something called a Sabbath. At the end of every round that you've hit a weakness, you can pull off a powerful Sabbath attack on the entire enemy party, which gets stronger the more stacks you accumulate. For the first couple of dungeons, that's basically all you need to know. If you played a recent Shin Megami Tensei or Persona title, you might be thinking, really? That's it? What if you get a critical hit? Does that let you act again, or give you a more powerful Sabbath? No, at least not until much later on, when you've slogged through the Soul Matrix enough to unlock that ability. What if an enemy blocks your attack or you miss? Would it take your Sabbath away, or maybe give it to the enemy party? In both Persona and SMT, using improper attacks on demons can cause you to lose a lot of potential actions, or have your character fall over for a turn. Not in this game. The enemy just blocks the hit, that's it. It's like they took a good system and just removed all the momentum and risk. Soul Hackers 2 does gradually introduce other features to its combat, like abilities that mix up what your Sabbath attack does. You can learn moves that add in healing depending on how many stacks you have, or more damage or status effects on enemies, but it's just not that exciting. You've also got commander skills, which are like special moves you can use every so often. You can learn abilities that let you switch out your entire party's demons in battle, or block a lot of incoming damage. Useful, sure, but I think it feels a bit plain. Shin Megami Tensei 5 had these kind of skills too, but it also had a core combat system that was a hundred times more fun. I'm not saying every game needs to have press turn or the one more system from Persona either. 
Another of my favorite games in the Megami Tensei franchise is Strange Journey, and the combat system featured in that game is actually a lot like this one. In that game, you had a party of four members, and hitting enemy weaknesses gave you a big attack. The reason I like Strange Journey's system so much more despite them being so similar is that in Strange Journey, your big attack was dependent on how many demons of the same alignment you had in your party. And to maximize your damage output, you'd want your own character to have an alignment that corresponded with them. It made team building fun. You were roleplaying, always trying to get that next Law Demon or that next Chaos Demon, and seeing their little portrait next to yours when you score a big attack. That shit's fun. Simple, sure, but fun. Soul Hackers takes the one thing that made that system somewhat interesting and dumbed it down even further. It's just hit weakness, big damage. Your demons hardly matter, and shit, you can't even see your demons in battle outside of when you're selecting one of their skills. Sure, they participate in Sabbath attacks, but you're not going to be watching that long animation every single time. Strange Journey can also get away with showing less. It's a DS game from 2009. This is a game that was put on the PS5 in 2022. Nothing wrong with using your imagination, but I guess I have different expectations for a modern 3D entry in the series. For a game about being a devil summoner, it's a bit ironic that it's the least tactical in recent memory, and barely involves the demons in combat at all. I actually even preferred the first Soul Hackers combat to this, like, by a lot. In that game you had a row system where you could shift party members' positions from front to back and left to right. Depending on where they were placed or what other demons they were next to, you could access different attacks and even a handful of special moves. There was also a loyalty system for each demon, which, while easily exploitable, was another neat feature that changed up the usual formula. What I like about the battle system in Soul Hackers 2 actually comes back to the characters. They're pretty chatty during combat, and I enjoyed that. Each party member reacts to items being used, attacks landed, attacks missed, getting downed, and there are several variations on each of these lines. You'll hear something different, for example, if Sizer revives Arrow compared to reviving Melody or Ringo. The characters snap back with little jokes to each other when using healing items. They'll yell at you if you're about to do something stupid. It's cool, it really helped bring the battles to life, and makes you feel a bit like you're in there with the team. The only problem with these lines is that they play extremely frequently, and sometimes multiple will play at the same time if you click through menus fast enough. I've definitely seen people annoyed by this, and it can get kinda old after a while, but I did appreciate the effort taken to have so many different possible interactions within your party. I also enjoyed customizing my party's summoning devices. You can visit a comp smith that lets you increase each of you guys' aptitudes for certain elements, and add on bonus skills that have a chance of triggering during battle. You can also equip items called mystiques that boost your damage with a particular element, or reduce the amount of MP that a skill might cost. These can be fun to collect, and let you conceptualize basic builds for your team. Fusion actually took a hit for this game too, compared to the first Soul Hackers. You used to be able to make Zoma demons that functioned a little bit differently than normal ones, forgoing the loyalty meter and taking different forms depending on when and how they were created. Zomas are in this game, but just as a plot device. The fusion system here is just the bog standard. You take a demon, you add another, you get a different one. In a series that is known for having engaging mechanics surrounding its battles, Soul Hackers 2 is not a shining example. It has a functional system and it does admittedly have its moments near the end of the game when you've gotten a lot of commander skills and upgraded your party to acquire sabots in different ways, but for most of my playthrough, I just felt like I was working my way up to the type of gameplay that you can experience within the first five minutes of pretty much any other modern Mega 10. Now this game might have fumbled the ball a bit with combat, but my god, when it comes to dungeons, it's like it tripped on its own shoelaces and fell face first into a bed of nails and then exploded. This might be one of the lowest points ever in the franchise for exploration. These dungeons, wowie. I thought Shin Megami Tensei 5 was mediocre when it came to level design. Soul Hackers 2 makes it look like a masterpiece. It makes those mazes on the back of a Denny's Kids menu look like architectural plans for a maze designed by Daedalus himself. Where should I even start? Okay, how about this? Let's look at the first Soul Hackers. Not really. Take a good look, and listen too.
Now, look at Soul Hackers 2. I mean guys, shit. The designs are some of the weakest I've seen. Shipping crates, two subway tunnel dungeons right after one another, shipping crates again? Literally the only visually appealing dungeon in the entire game is the last one, this reality warping skyscraper thing. And don't even get me started on the unholy soul matrix. It's a mostly optional repetitive dungeon where you can access more story bits for each character. Notice I said, mostly optional. It's something intended to be tackled outside of the main story, but you're mandated to play it twice. Did they run out of ideas for other stages to pad out the game? Each character has their own soul matrix, but they all look and play exactly the same. In the music, it's a sin. Dungeon music in this franchise tends to be incredible, but here it's just the same piano thing over and over for nearly every stage. The Soul Matrix has its own theme, but you bet your ass it does not change no matter how deep you go. Look at these layouts, there's so much empty space, nothing going on, no secret treasure chests or hidden NPCs or anything. These feel like the randomly generated dungeons from Persona 3 and 4. Except worse. Yeah, worse. At least in those games, you were seeing a different layout every time you walked in. And it made sense why they were mediocre. They were generated by a machine. You can't tell me these stages were designed by a person, but apparently they were. It's like they ran that dungeon generator program one time for each stage and were like, yep, this is good. Throw in some locked doors and we're good to go. These dungeons look like they were created by spilling milk on a table and then drawing lines around the way it spilled. There was a moment in the Soul Matrix during a teleport maze where I just stood there and took a screenshot and thought, wow, this looks bad. It's a shame so much progression is tied to this place. On the subject of teleports, puzzles are pretty weak overall. I've actually come to like navigating tricky mazes and putting up with traps you see in the old school games, but whereas the classic dungeon crawlers have layouts that you can tell were designed by a person to be challenging affairs to test your resource management, Soul Hackers 2 just feels lazy and haphazard. Many dungeons don't even have puzzles and are literally just long paths to a boss fight at the end. The ones that do have puzzles tend to be like, okay, go find a key. It's impossible to get lost or really feel like you're exploring at all. You guys might think I'm going way too hard on this, I mean it's clearly a budget title, but when games that came out 20 years ago are doing battles and exploration better, what am I supposed to say? You think Devil Summoner or the first Soul Hackers had a big budget? Maybe this game should have been a first person dungeon crawler if they truly didn't have the resources to design 3D dungeons. Those familiar with the franchise may have noticed, I didn't talk about demon negotiation during the combat section. Yeah, well that wasn't a mistake. They took it out of combat and made all negotiation take place out here in the stages themselves. Demons that are in your party will appear randomly throughout a dungeon, and they'll hand out consumables and plot items like keycards, as well as introduce you to other demons that may want to join your party. If you're at the appropriate level to recruit them, all you have to do is give them the first thing they ask for. If you do that, you cannot fail. If you don't have the item they want, they don't even really get mad at you or anything like that, they just leave. This is without a doubt the worst incarnation of demon negotiation out of any Mega Ten game I've played. Digital Devil Story had a better system than this. I understand maybe wanting to move away from the typical format, but this is shallow. There's no risk taking. 
and if there's a demon you want, it sucks to be constantly fighting it in combat, but have to wait for one of these guys on the overworld to introduce you to it. Just let me do it myself. Given that the combat isn't especially strong, I can't imagine why they decided to do away with this too. I'll say, it is cool seeing your demons hang out in the stages, even though they don't move. They do have a funny line here and there, but they do repeat quite a lot, and there isn't much variety. I save the single most annoying thing about dungeons for last, Mimi. Listen, this owl is kinda cute. I like how it looks, but she is 100% pointless. I am never the kind of person to think of my own opinion as objective truth, but I think this is one part of my life where it might be. This game did not need Mimi. She acts as your navigator throughout most of the game's dungeons. What that means is, she points out enemies and items to you. It is infuriating. Okay, so enemies in this game spawn on the map. They have a passive phase just walking around, an alert phase where they chase you, and if you hit them and knock them over, they stay on the ground and you can walk past them. Mimi alerts you to each one. Every single time. Look, Ringo, it's an enemy. The enemy's chasing you. Oh, you knocked it down. We're good. Repeat this literally every five seconds, and that's what Mimi's like. You don't need her to tell you that this big ass demon's in front of you. I know, I see it. It even makes its own noise when it spawns. You don't need to comment when I knock over the 400th demon. I know what's knocked over. I did that. These dialogues repeat so often, it is dementia inducing. The repetitiveness of the battle dialogues have nothing on Mimi. Enemy! Care yeah. I can relax. Enemy! Get ready! <laughs> now we can relax. Incoming! When Fig leaves the party near the end of the game for the final encounter, you get this replacement navigator that has a male voice. My god, he's the same way. Enemy spotted. Enemy alerted. Enemy defeated. The frequency that these lines play has almost convinced me this game was not playtested at all. Like, someone would have noticed. Someone would have said something if they played this for more than five minutes. Well, I think that about wraps up my thoughts on this whole thing. Let's end the video off on a positive note with one last section, the aesthetics. I don't know, I think it's worth talking about. This game's got some good art. The character portraits look great, the backgrounds of the shops really stand out, the hub areas while small are really neat looking, it's solid stuff. The Soul Matrix cutscenes while a bit repetitive also look great. I love how cherry blossoms float in the wind in parts of the city, how comfy the hideout looks, and I really like this Breaking Bad reference. The music in the city areas and shops is enjoyable too, and is far, far better than that stuff you'll be listening to in the dungeons. Alright, let's wrap it up. I think Soul Hackers 2 is a game with a solid concept that just falls through in ways that are surprising for a franchise with a legacy for having great gameplay. The characters are by far the best part, and really were the driving force holding me to finishing this game. I wanted to see where each of their stories went, and that was enough to pull me through some incredibly lackluster dungeon crawling in mediocre combat. I'm not sure if that will be enough for most people though. I think the mixed reception this game got is fitting. Personally, I think this game is a 6 out of 10. This is actually the same score I gave Shin Megami Tensei 5, which to me had terrible characters, great combat, and okay exploration. Last time, a lot of people seemed to think 6 was a low score. I guess I look at it a little differently. To me, a 5 out of 10 is, well, middle of the road. It's average. So a 6 out of 10 is slightly above average. This is a game that you want to jump into if you're brand new to the series, or maybe if you're a hardcore fan that wants to see everything Atlas has to offer. Regular fans are going to want to wait for a sale. It can be a good time waster, and it's far from being outright bad, but I expect a bit better from such a massive franchise that has had so many years of experience making games. Honestly, I didn't see myself doing another review like this so quickly. This game came out fast after Shin Megami Tensei 5. I do hope we see another Soul Hackers game someday, or at least another crack at the Devil Summoner universe. I know Atlas can do it. 
Thanks for watching to the end if you made it this far, and let me know what you thought of the game. This is a bit of a divisive one, and I'm interested to see what you guys think too. This has been my review of Soul Hackers 2, and I'll see you guys in the next video.